there still exist in the central VAR natural landscapes interspersed with vineyards and olive groves and here and there a typical village. Since the 1950s, many small agricultural areas ceased to be maintained and were abandoned, so pine trees grew instead. During periods of drought, these places are susceptible to forest fires, as in 2003 when hundreds of acres of pine and garrig burned. However, these devastating fires create conditions suitable for the repopulation of the area by different fauna and flora. This subalpine warbler chases some small insects. The grassy areas of the Garrig are very important for biodiversity but they are becoming more and more scarce. In this location, which falls under the legislation of Natura 2000, protecting areas of natural significance, the grazing of a flock of sheep prevents the spontaneous regrowth of the herbage. The beady eyes of this short-toed eagle scrutinize the terrain in search of a snake, its main diet. No luck this time. This ideal place is where a rare small butterfly lives. At the beginning of spring, a newly hatched Tamaris ballus rests perfectly camouflaged in the vegetation. This species always rests with its wings closed, and around 11am when it has warmed up, it flies off towards the flowers to drink nectar. The underside of the posterior wing is moss green, whilst the underside of the anterior wing is a brick red colour with black dots. Like this, it is perfectly adapted to its habitat and is practically invisible. The brown upper wings of the males are only visible when they are in flight as we see here. Gradually the earth warms up and the ants, Tapinoma nigerimum, build up their anthills in such a way that they fully benefit from the sun's rays. Ants play a significant role in the life of this butterfly. At the beginning of the afternoon, this male tops up his energy. Full up, he flies off to a twig. And cleans his antennae. Then goes in search of a suitable territory and settles down in position. Around three, a female busies herself on the track. She flies into the male's territory, lands, and then heads right for the middle, settling down there. The resident male spots her and comes directly to meet her and tries to mate. She moves off and he follows her. He's keen, but she escapes again. They set off towards the border of the territory and land on a cistus. The game of seduction continues. The male, attracted by the female's pheromones, continues to advance. 
The female, as well as being larger than the male, can be distinguished from him by the red marks on the anterior wings, which are easily visible when she's taking off. A little further away in the garrig, at the edge of the territory, the couple unite. It seems the female chooses a male by his ability to synchronize, and if he can keep time with the aerial acrobatics, his reward will be permission to mate. The female is always on top. The moss green colour turns to blue-grey with age, as we see here with this male. After an hour, the mating is over and the butterflies separate. The male goes back to his territory, preens himself and waits patiently and attentively for a new female to pass by. At the end of the afternoon, the male shelters in a cistus at the edge of his territory to spend the night there and sleep. In the cool of the early morning, a female is still asleep on some thyme. But as soon as the temperature rises above 17 degrees centigrade, the butterflies wake up, become active and leave in search of nectar. Close by, the red-legged partridge searches for grain. The surrounding hills, adjoining the Natura 2000 zones, are being replanted with vines. In the past, this work was carried out using horses, thus partially maintaining the natural vegetation. Today, huge trucks are used to create well-drained terraces, transforming the original environment. Gangs of wild boar turn the ground over looking for nourishment, so creating places for young host plants to grow, on which the butterflies depend. Lucerne polymorph is one such host plant thriving in open stony ground. The female looks carefully for the ideal place in which to lay an egg, feeling the leaves of the host plant with her abdomen. The eggs are placed separately, one by one. It can still be cool at the beginning of April, so the female warms her abdomen from time to time in the sun to help ripen her eggs. And then continues to lay them one egg per leaf. From time to time she drinks, so as to gather her strength. The next day, a female prepares for a new day. Then drinks from a time. And flies off towards another host plant, Dorycnium hirsutum which grows in a more arid zone. 
Most of the eggs are laid at the tip of small, low-growing plants. The egg, well hidden between the leaves, is a pale green colour. Another host plant, Dorichnium pentaphyllum, grows more commonly in open spaces of the garrig. The chance of survival for this species is increased by the various sites used for egg laying. Suddenly a thunderstorm strikes and the butterflies shelter remaining stationary amongst the vegetation. One morning, a shepherd fenced in his flock just where eggs had been laid on Dorichnium hirsutum. A little way off, a female refreshes herself on some time. A young, oscillated lizard closely watches the movements of a butterfly from his hiding place. Unconcerned of any danger, it flies off unharmed. After a few days, an egg hatches just outside the area where the herd of sheep is enclosed. This tiny caterpillar has a chance, while most of the others will not have escaped the jaws of the sheep. After the flock moves off, a layer of droppings several centimetres deep covers the soil. The flock's prolonged stay in one area has a catastrophic effect. As a result, brambles and other nitrogen-loving plants like grasses replace the small, low-growing plants on which Tamaris ballus depends. For reasons still unknown, the caterpillar at the second larval stage pokes its abdomen out of the flower. At a different location in the field, another egg on lucerne is ready to hatch. The little newly hatched caterpillar has a good look at his whereabouts and finds a direct path to a cluster of flower buds, its main food source. During the first days, it feeds inside the protection of the flower buds. Several days later, on Dorichnion hirsutum, the caterpillar escapes the eye of a young predatory ground bug, which at this early stage resembles an ant. In the field, the caterpillars on the lucerne feed on the yellow flowers and as a result take on their colour, thus improving their camouflage. Not only do they eat the lucerne flowers, but also the fruits which are rich in proteins. As they grow, the caterpillars become more and more active, regularly moving off to other plants in order to avoid the build-up of toxins produced by the medicargo species, as a defence against attack from the caterpillars.
During cloudy spells, at the edge of the field, two caterpillars on Derichnium hirsutum are surrounded by little ants, Tapinuma nigerimum, which are attracted to the caterpillar's melliferous gland. Note that these caterpillars feeding on Derichnium hirsutum petals take on the pink colour. The caterpillars also have two retractable tentacles for alerting the ants. Then the weather worsens. After a shower, another larger ant species, Camponotus aethiops, is drawn to the caterpillars. This worker reacts to the tentacles. An ant commander meticulously makes his tour of inspection around the whole caterpillar. A small ant, Tapinoma nigerimum, tries in vain to chase away the Camponotus aethiops. The latter rubs himself in an effort to rid itself of the formic acid sprayed at it. In the field, the caterpillar has also been discovered by Tapinoma nigerimum, attracted by the sweet secretion. The occipital plaque is easily visible on the mature caterpillar. A small group of ants gathers around the melliferous gland. Frequently, drops of nectar are squeezed from the mellifer gland, driving the ants crazy. The caterpillar is protected from its enemies through this symbiosis with the ants. In the final stage, the caterpillar leaves to look for a place to undergo its transformation. The ants guide it to their anthill where it will metamorphosize. The caterpillar passes the winter protected in the form of a chrysalis. In January, work started on developing the vineyards located within land protected under Natura 2000. The vegetation was covered under tons of soil.
Any species overwintering in this location had no hope of surviving. The trucks came and went dozens of times, dumping their loads on the land. This unique countryside is transformed forever and will become a single crop requiring regular treatments. The biodiversity destroyed and another habitat is lost. Luckily, until now, this zone higher up has escaped the earthworks. It is here, in an anthill, that a Tamaris ballus chrysalis has survived. At the beginning of April, a male hatches and climbs up the vegetation and inflates his wings. After an hour, the wings are dry and he is ready for his first flight. Despite all the reproductive strategies of this butterfly, what is its hope for survival? Not only extensive urban development, but also in more rural areas, human intervention eats into the so-called protected sites. <laughs> 